Beautiful. Welcome, welcome, welcome to those of you who are here already for the Edmund J. Stafford Center's public lecture uh, discussion of COVID-19. We're going to give people one more minute to come in um, and get adjusted before we kick off, um, but welcome. Thank you. Oh, no, it's, it's great to have you guys. I'm really, as I was saying before, I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. So um, when everything hit, I was joking with everybody about we're going to have to, and we, we were worried what we we're going to do with our public lecture series. We were thinking, well, we'll have to start Safra TV. And here we are, basically. <laughs> Safra TV. Uh, so now we need some music. We don't have any music yet for, for Safra TV or our countdown clocks and things like that. So we have um, we have some work to do to get there probably, but the core of, of our business of um, thoughtful conversation, we're absolutely ready for. So yeah, that will do. Okay, I think I just got the signal. So let me say welcome again to everybody who's joining us tonight for a conversation about how we collectively get our minds around COVID-19 and our responses to it. Um, we have all been through a lot um, in the last months, months, and some people through extraordinary and unthinkable things. And so it's important, I think, to take a moment just to um, cast our minds in the direction of all the people on the front lines um, and all the people who are suffering um, because the magnitude um, is extraordinary and we owe people a lot for the work they're doing as well as owe compassion um, to so many who have already lost loved ones, um, including I'm sure people on this call right now. Um, so let's just start there um, thinking of that. But as I said, um, we're here really for our collective conversation at the Edmund J. Taffer Center for Ethics. Our goal is always to bring people together to think about the hardest questions of ethics and values that are at the center of our shared decision making. And we are so lucky this evening to have three of the most thoughtful people thinking about our hard choices um, in this pandemic. So I want to introduce them to you. We will have a conversation with Q&A spliced through. I'll say something more about that in a moment, but first let me just introduce my guests. Um, we have with us medical anthropologist and physician Paul Farmer. He has de dedicated his life to improving healthcare for the world's poorest people. He is co-founder of Partners in Health, an international nonprofit that provides direct healthcare services to those who are sick and living in poverty and pioneers novel community-based treatment strategies to deliver high quality healthcare and resource poor settings. He's also my colleague here at Harvard and I'm just really grateful that he was able to take time away from the work he's currently doing in Massachusetts um, to be with us tonight. I'm also really glad that we have Govind Prasad. Um, Govind holds a JD and PhD and is assistant professor at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. Um, he's also a Greenwall Foundation faculty scholar in bioethics. His research interests include the ethical and legal dimensions of health insurance, healthcare financing, and markets and healthcare services, as well as the ethics and regulation of medical research. You'll have seen his name in the press recently as he's been writing about rationing um, in the time of COVID, and we'll get into the really hard questions um, about what you do when you don't have enough to help everybody. Um, and then Allison Stanger. Allison is Technology and Human Values Senior Fellow this year uh, here at the Edmund J. Stafford Center for Ethics. She's also a visiting professor of government. Um, she is also uh, in her home institution, Russell Lang, professor of international politics and economics at Middlebury College. She is an expert on matters of national security, the author most recently of Whistleblowers, Honesty in America from Washington to Trump. Um, she's a frequent testifier before Congress and a really astute thinker about geopolitics and the position of the US in a global context. So welcome, thank you so much for being here. Paul, you have such an extraordinary depth of experience fighting infectious diseases. I mean, that's uh, a strange thing to say to a person that, you know, that's, yeah. you know, but you, you are a person who has seen and, and fought many infectious diseases, epidemics all over the world. I hoped you might just start by helping us all think about um, the question of this moment, how it compares to others. Though, as I ask you that, I also realize I neglected to say to everybody, for Q&A, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. 
at any point. Don't wait till we call Q&A. Just throw your questions in. Somebody's going to be reading the Q&A and picking out questions. If you'd like to be acknowledged when the question is asked with your name, then please include your name, but you don't have to. So Q&A is open now. As we talk, please put questions into the chat. Um, now let me turn back to Paul. Um, Paul, can you um, start by helping us think about how this pandemic compares to other epidemics that you've experienced? Sure. I mean, um, it is a bizarre thing, though, isn't it, to be able to say to a friend of yours, gee, you've, you've been doing this for decades, but it's true, you know, um, and you get a certain ability to make comparisons that's not unwelcome, even if it's just for psychological or social reasons. But um, to, 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 to make, I just finished writing, as you know, this book about Ebola. So I was hoping that I would be able to say, well, the thing about Ebola that reminds me of COVID-19, but it's really not the same. You know, mm -hmm. this is, this, the, the, the sweep of what we're enduring right now and seeing right now is so, um, is so epic, as the young people say, that it's hard to compare it to a regionally bounded epidemic. So it, let me just st step back as an infectious disease doctor and say, we, we generally tend to do this. Okay, you got your viruses, you got your bacteria, you got your parasites, you got your mycobacteria. And they do different things. They're different classes of organisms. The ones that humans have the greatest trouble with tend to be the viruses. Uh, 200 plus viruses really cause a lot of trouble for humans. And um, the reasons that we have immune systems at all is our immune systems evolved in response to threats like the ones we're, we're facing now. So again, they may be viral, they may be bacterial like the plague, they may be a, a parasite like malaria. We've, uh, we've come up with these um, infections, um, these epidemics, and, and so every once in a while they change human history a great, a great deal. And I feel that experientially, instead of saying, well, some are bloodborne, some are airborne, some are waterborne, some are sexually transmitted. No, it's really the dimensions. And the, the dimensions of this are really something that I haven't seen before. And uh, just to give you a couple of differences and then open this up for others, you know, uh, Ebola um, in West Africa, 99% of all the cases in the end were in Liberia, Sierra Leone, in Guinea. So it was actually highly limited to this place called Upper West Africa. It was also not spread as a respiratory virus. You remember at the beginning of the COVID or uh, the new uh, coronavirus, you know, one of the questions that your medical colleagues and others in public health were asking is, how much is this airborne? How much is this contact borne? What is going to be the nature of spread? And that's still coming to light now. But for me, the difference is not which one is airborne, which one is waterborne, which one is foodborne. It's really that this is the big one. And we just so, haven't had a big one yeah. for 101 years, you know, and- uh, So I wanna just talk about that for a quick second. Um, when you say it's the big one, on some level, we all know that we're all at home. Yeah. And, or I shouldn't say we're all at home, 40% of people are essential workers and are working without adequate protection um, in the workplace. Nonetheless, the national narrative is that we're all at home in a sort of national quarantine that's unheard of in our lifetime. So we registered experientially yeah. that it's the big one. But when you, when, what are the sort of details? Is it about the case fatality rate? Is yeah. it about the rate of transmission and infectiousness? Like what is it that actually makes this the big one? Um, First of all, I'm glad to bring up case fatality rate. I just say that that's my go-to, my go-to number for any kind of new uh, epidemic or new pathogen, right? Is uh, and of course we, the, one of the one of the things reasons I like going to case fatality rate first is because of course you're you're taking these numbers and then interpreting them in a template of a health system, you know, the host factors factors involved with a new pathogen, a new mutant, say. So going through that process of deciding which one's worst and which one's not is, 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 is the next step. Case fatality rate, the reproductive rate are, are, are not. It, you know, when I finished this book about um, Ebola a few months ago, I had, you know, a, my fancy New York editor 
saying, well, what about this term flattening the curve? And what about this jargon, our you know, reproductive rate? Nobody's asking me those questions anymore. They're, they're all too happy to, to say that this is now part of the national discussion. So experientially, as you said, that's what the, the you know, that's one reason I'll call it the big one. Is it going to affect 50, 100 million people? I sure as hell hope not, right? And we're not the yeah. same people as 101 years ago. We have new tools at our disposal. But right. uh, experientially, that's where I was going. Right, okay, got it. And I appreciate that, thank you. Um, and so in, in this country, in the coverage of it, it must be said, I mean, the focus is really on the US. I mean, that's not surprising. And the focus on the failures here at home to be prepared to respond quickly and so forth. But this is a global experience. The shocks are global. The health shocks, we're clear about the economic shocks. We're, we already have registered Great Depression levels of unemployment and other kinds of economic impacts. So, you know, not Great Recession, Great Depression levels of impact, and we have to take that really seriously. Um, but what about um, geopolitics, Allison? I mean, I think we're not hearing as much about um, how this relates to the sort of health of the global system as a whole and whether or not we should be thinking about instability in that case. And I, you know, I asked that question also wanting to register the sort of incredible um, danger of tremendous loss of life across the whole span of the world too. So I mean, I think another sort of piece of the, the global global picture, but Allison? Yeah, no, I think uh, you put your, put your finger on a really important issue that's only going to become more important over time because we all sense that we're in, that something has completely changed. And we really are on a war footing in all sorts of ways, but it's not a war against another country even though it can be quite confusing given what some politicians are saying, it really is a health war against a common enemy. And across the world, we share that enemy. So there's been a lot of rhetoric about China's role in starting the virus. And because they have an uh, autocratic system, unlike ours, you're going to see more of that. Uh, it's, it, it's politically motivated. But I think it's important to, to reflect on how this is different from say our confrontation with the Soviet Union. It's not some kind of new cold war. And it's different in, in at least three ways, I think. One, the search for a vaccine, you know, that's not the Manhattan Project because it's a scientific discovery that will benefit humanity, not a particular country. So if we get that vaccine, it's something that's going to be shared and there'll be supply problems, but it just doesn't translate into a wartime sort of threat. Secondly- It's a weapon of mass salvation. That's a good way of putting it, Paul. That's exactly what it is. And I think that's an extraordinary um, platform for, for treating it differently and doing something positive. Another thing to keep in mind is that the eco global economy makes this totally different. Mm -hmm. The Chinese and American economies are, are interdependent. If you look back on say the Soviet and American economies, they weren't. And what that means really is that you can't win a war against the coronavirus for one country. It really- So does that problems. mean the war metaphor though is just the wrong metaphor? And I have to plead guilty yeah. to being a person who has used that metaphor, right? I sort of use that metaphor to try to um, really rally energies, get people to think about the intensity of investment of energy and resources that we need to bring to this. But I have to admit, I've been having second thoughts about yeah. the no, no, but metaphor. You're right that it's like a war and that we've got to mobilize all the resources at our disposal and we've got to pull together as a country and as, as you know, a planet <laughs> to defeat this virus. But again, the, the real salvation is that it's a war against a common threat and we'll see the threat play out sequentially so that really provides the possibility for one nation to help another nation when they need it, and then reciprocity to prevail. They well, can pass down the road. Let me pull Govind in here too, because I'd love to get your um, way of sketching out the magnitude of the problem, Govind, onto the table here, because we can think about this as a common problem. And in fact, it is a common problem. On the other hand, um, what this common problem routinely is making us do is sort of pick who gets to benefit and who doesn't get to benefit through all of our choices. So it feels like we're having a really hard time um, finding a way to approach addressing this virus that actually 
can in any way be experienced as a as as treating as a fully common problem where burdens are say equally shared across um, everybody. So, Govind, how would you sketch the magnitude or the specific features of the collective problem that we have? Sure. So let me say first that I actually think there are there are a few things that I find especially frustrating because they really do seem to me like win-win solutions. I think often we're going to face trade-offs that are um, what I'm going to call next life-life trade-offs, where there are lives on both sides. But there are some things that seem to me like they're actually going to be quite hard to accomplish politically, but are ethically the easier questions. I was thinking about voting by mail, for instance. You have big popular support for that. Um, it's not obvious that there's any countervailing reason on the other side. And yet, some of these um, things that I think are ethically, um, I think, for instance, across our panel, maybe if you look at the broader population as well, people might agree on, are actually very challenging because of facts about our political structures um, to get implemented. Um, so I think there are a bunch of things that are like that, voting by mail, um, not letting private debt collectors seize these um, payments that folks are getting, um, things having to do with um, not uh, having uh, pollution regulations be undone that seem like win-win solutions. And I think it's important to, to recognize those and recognize that um, there are frustrating political obstacles that prevent some of these, I think, win-win solutions. But I think that there are also some, some harder um, ethical questions um, that I think do present these trade-offs. So, so one that, I think the, the first one that comes to mind uh, for me and I think for a lot of us is I'm thinking about um, uh, people keep talking about, oh, when are we going to reopen the economy? And it's much more complex than that because there are so many different um, infection control measures that might be in place right now that might be relaxed or changed in some ways or applied to fewer people as opposed to everyone. And each one of those presents these kinds of, and people talk about, oh, it's lives versus the economy. I think right now it's easy to say that because most of the reopening proponents right now um, what they would propose would be bad for the economy and bad for lives. But there's going to be a point, I think, where you really are going to have life-life trade-offs. You have that even now with things like if you're delaying surgeries, um, if you're delaying uh, vaccinations for kids right now, um, you are uh, doing good on the one hand by preventing the spread of COVID-19. You're also um, potentially uh, placing risks on some people. Uh, you see that for broader things like education. And so my question for that is, you know, how can you do that fairly and ideally, um, and I'll get back to this when we talk about um, triage, about rationing, um, how can we both save more lives and give priority to people who are the least advantaged? So I've been thinking about that as somebody who took uh, my kid up until now to um, daycare on public transit. You know, how do we reopen a service like that that is um, used by people who are disadvantaged? I have the option right. to right now drive to the grocery. Folks who don't right. have the option, what, what, what does that look look like? That's that's really helpful. Thank you. I um, I'm sitting here as I'm sort of thinking about how we define the problem and the goal, um, and sort of registering that um, it's sort of you know in the world of children's games, you've got those games that are adversarial and conflict oriented games, and you've also got cooperative games. And somehow we have to figure out how to get ourselves all to a place of recognizing that we are actually in a cooperative game and. I mean, there are still differential burdens and so forth, even though it's inside a cooperative game and one has to figure out how to put those two pieces together. That's one of the hardest ethical challenges. Anna is bringing us questions. So, Anna? Yes, hello. Um, these first questions come from Usabel Pachado, and I'm sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. He's from MGH in the Dominican Republic. Um, a great fan of yours, Dr. Farmer. And the questions are, first, what structures do you suggest we should have in place to avoid a similar situation to reoccur in the future? Well, um, I, you know, I, I, I also just want to applaud you for asking the question because, um, you know, if we don't ask it again and again, and uh, it's going to feel a lot like the last time and we can't afford that. Um, you know, if I, I, let me just go to some very specific places uh, that I, I uh, where, where things have been done. Um, you know, instead of just saying, well, here's what we didn't do last time. Um, you know, after the earthquake in Haiti, which was 10 years ago, the big earthquake in Haiti, um, it was estimated that more than half of all American households donated to Haitian earthquake relief. And I found that in the middle of the uh, epicenter, I found that deeply moving um, and instructive. Could that be true? Yeah, it could be true, I thought. Um, 
And, uh, and we started hearing the same discussions that we're hearing now. How can we link our disaster response, our crisis response, to systems um, that would prevent or lessen the, um, you know, the extremes, some of the extremes that we're seeing now. And um, you'd be surprised, everybody asked the question, but unless we can enforce, kind of force ourselves to act honorably by legislation, say, or some, some possibility for shaming in the humanitarian world. But um, one of the things that we did was to say, Okay, we received money as partners in health. This sounds like one of those ethical, you know, pretty soon there's going to be a, a train or a trolley coming down the, the tracks. But we had received a lot of unsolicited donations. So what do we do with it? Well, we decided that since the teaching hospitals of Haiti were destroyed more or less in one day, you know, the medical schools and nursing schools. I mean, the, the, the public nursing school was a total loss. Very few third year uh, nursing students survived and neither did their faculty. So that seemed an area that where you could say, will this, might this help? Will this harm? And the answer was, uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, we were prepared when people said, well, this is hardly the, it's not a time to build a, a new teaching hospital in Haiti. This is not a, it's not a priority time. And, you, and I thought, well, if it's not a priority now when their teaching hospitals have just been destroyed, when on earth would it ever be a priority? So we built the hospital. We also built a lab, a biosecurity three level lab, the only one in Haiti and one of the only ones in the Caribbean, because as often happens after uh, a, a war or just, uh, in this case, a not so natural disaster like an earthquake, there was a huge cholera epidemic within seven months. And this was the largest cholera epidemic in, uh, in the world at the time, up to a million people got infected. So again, we tried to do some things that would put us in a better situation the next time around. Back to my colleague from the MGH, his, his, his question is, those are the kind of things, surveillance, emergency care, what have you laid aside for our improvident times where we're gonna have events like what are happening now uh, and I'm glad to say that in Haiti and in West Africa, in both those examples, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and, uh, and Haiti, we did that structurally by putting in place institutions and frameworks that were Haitian or Rwandan or, you know, or Sierra Leonean or whatever, that there were local institutions designed to lessen the suffering that would come along the next time there was a major fill in the blank, natural disaster or uh, epidemic. I mean, it's not rocket science, right? If we had had some of those billions of dollars that went into um, Ebola in West Africa, if some of that had been dedicated to a really robust Sierra Leone CDC, really robust district hospitals, even one or two of them, and we did do one or two of them, then that would be one place where there'd be less risk in the event of an epidemic like the one we're seeing today. So that sounds uh, like a a little bit pedestrian, but I'm afraid I'm going to stick with pedestrian in yeah. the middle of an epidemic. Now, we've been talking at some of the work we're doing at the Safra Center about pandemic resilience and the need for pandemic resilience, the sort of permanent durable need for pandemic resilience. And so people sometimes separate response and preparedness. And we've been trying to make the argument that no, those things shouldn't be separate, actually. They're, they're the same thing, basically. Yeah. Um, exactly what you need to get through is what you should have done before, but just means you got to do it now. You got to do it now, got to do it faster, basically, if you haven't done it before, so that you can have a pandemic resilient society. Um, and I think we should, um, I think we should be bold enough to say that we refuse to use the word resilience to describe the, the attributes of some beleaguered in, in, individual. You know, it's like when I, when I, what we you know what really gets me right now here we're having a great session. <laughs> it's that now people are saying oh the you know we're not immune the great leveler and then suddenly oh wait right 70 percent of all the people who died in chicago last week are african-american yeah you know like rediscovering the the ways in which these these events these and pandemic time works it well works itself into our social inequalities is very painful. To so watch. It's, it's incredibly painful to watch. And I want to come back to exactly what is required of resilience, testing, tracing, 
Yeah. So reported isolation, TTSI, we've all learned new vocabulary. Okay, P PPE, we all know that now, personal protective equipment. I think we all need to learn TTSI, testing, tracing, and supported isolation. I'm going to come back to your work, Paul, but before I do, I want to pick up the point you just made about Chicago and disparities in terms of how people are suffering with regard to COVID. Um, and I know that's a conversation that Govind has been very much involved in because Govind's been writing about triage decisions, how to think about that. And there was an op-ed I think published uh, today or yesterday in the New York Times arguing that the triage systems that we use, the sort of weighting of lives, um, have racial biases in them. They um, give us, you know, sort of, they count up risks and vulnerabilities um, related to how likely a person is to survive and for how long. And the result of that is that health disparities replicate themselves in people with less uh, resilient health being uh, prioritized at a lower level for life-saving treatments. Um, I have probably not represented that correctly, Govind, yeah. so if you could perhaps share um, what the sort of standard uh, triage protocols are that are in use um, and then um, introduce us to this debate, that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, I, I have to admit, I was expecting this more toward the end, so I'm just moving around a little now to get to this here. Um, yeah. Sure. So um, one of the um, facts in the U.S., because of it being a federal system, is that you don't have one national triage protocol. And in a lot of ways, I think that's a good thing. You have states that have developed their protocols by doing um, deliberative democratic um, public engagement work to see what uh, folks in their state um, value um, how they would set priorities in a pandemic setting. Minnesota's done that, Maryland's done that. Um, but um, I think the values that are in common across a lot of them, as you say, are um, emphasizing the value of um, saving more lives. And then uh, many of them also incorporate the value of saving um, more years of life. Um, and I think um, there, there are really compelling reasons to care about these values. I think saving the most lives in particular strikes me as a very difficult value to not put a lot of weight on. If you look at the rest of our COVID-19 response, um, so much of it has been organized around trying to save the most lives, things like stay home, save lives. What are you telling people there is to save the most lives? Um, at the same time, I think um, what the um, recent um, op-ed you're mentioning and um, other work as well, um, seeing some of the ways that um, uh, COVID-19 has had um, differential impacts on um, people in different communities, has had more serious impacts um, sort of so, so far, especially on communities of color, people who are poor, people are talking now about risks of it having these impacts in rural communities. Um, what some of these proposals have talked about is, you know, is there some way to um, change uh, triage proposals to account for that? Um, and uh, what I would say is, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to incorporate the idea of giving a priority to the worst off, but there are challenges in how to do that fairly. The first thing I would say that is really important to avoid is to say, oh, because of potential unfairness, we have to um, uh, abandon the project of trying to save more lives and go to something like a first come first served system or a lottery system. I think um, that sacrifices real lives to a um, sort of very formal idea of equality. And it also, if you look at the actual um, surveys of um, communities, this Maryland survey that I talked about, and another one um, just outside of San Antonio, um, actual communities reject those models for triage. They say, um, look, that doesn't take seriously a lottery, the um, medical needs of people. Um, something like first come, first serve doesn't take seriously where hospitals are placed. So I've been talking with some um, economists um, here at um, MIT and Boston College about um, how you could fairly incorporate a priority to the worst off into a system that considers medical evidence to save more lives. And I think it's easier to do that in some ways by thinking about that at a macro allocation level, where say ventilators are going than at the micro level of which patient gets one. Even at the micro level of who gets it, you could try to do that. Um, I think that there are ways that you could do it um, where you um, uh, try say within patients with a similar uh, probability of survival, you give some priority to people who are disadvantaged. But there are also legal and ethical challenges in doing that. Um, the legal challenges, for instance, that um, there would be real legal problems with um, the New York Times editorial mentions uh, waiting based on race or ethnicity. Um, mm -hmm. I think that would be very legally prob problematic. 
So I wanted to sort of try to figure out the relationship between what Paul was talking about sort of building hospitals and what you're talking about, about sort of adjusting uh, triage protocols to try to give more weight to the disadvantage and try to understand whether these are sort of complementary ideas or um, sort of ideas that run at cross purposes um, at all. So in other words, I understand sort of Paul was describing a debate about whether or not um, in a moment of emergency um, in Haiti to whether or not to build teaching hospitals, or I guess the presumption, the other side of the argument must have been, should you just put all of that money straight into clinical care in some fashion? Was that the rough shape of the debate, Paul, um, in terms of the decision? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. You're on mute. You have to... Let's just say for now, yes. Okay. There's more to it if we have time. I'm sure, I'm sure there's more, more to it. So, um, so then, I mean, in some sense. Um, well, let me just say, okay. let me just say that instead of the trade-off being with nice little clinical services for the ill or injured, it was invest in development, right? So, right. it was the the fight was really um, between the development and the disaster relief people. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the patients were of luck. Right. Okay. So, but I mean, the question I was getting at, I suppose, was that the picture that you're looking at, Paul, is one that's really taking a long-term view. Yeah. So it's sort of saving lives over a, a long arc of time, as opposed to saving lives today, tomorrow, and so forth. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how these things can be reconciled or whether they can't be reconciled at all. That is, uh, one might say, Govind, that um, to focus on triage is sort of the wrong question, that what we should actually be doing is figuring out how to rebuild as fast as possible the underlying infrastructure of the healthcare system um, so that we're delivering a better degree of health period. Um, and that we shouldn't delay that. We shouldn't sort of wait till after the crisis is over, but we should sort of start working that sort of through the crisis. Uh, so how do you, Govin, think about the relationship between that investment in long-term improvement that brings broader well-being um, health, saves lives in that regard, versus focusing on things like triage protocols and so forth? I have to say, for that example, I don't see the, the tension there. It seems to me you can both pursue the goal of trying to save more lives through, um, say, um, having more testing, more P PPE right now, um, uh, building more um, public health capacity down the road to do things like tracing, and um, try to triage to do that at the micro level. I think I do see some arguments saying, if you triage at the micro level, I was looking at a very provocative, interesting piece by um, Kamara Jones on Newsweek, where she says, um, if you have a lottery, maybe the threat of a lottery system would stimulate more rapid production of life-saving resources. I feel really troubled and uneasy about that argument, because it seems to me like it's holding people's lives hostage in order to try to motivate decision makers to build hospitals. I think we can both work to build hospitals and also work to try to have uh, triage that um, saves more lives as opposed to saying, look, uh, these people's lives will get it unless you get more ventilators. So that makes a lot of sense. And I think it does point to a piece of work to do, right? Because the sort of triage protocols at some level have the job of making, like letting us stretch our resources as far as we can, um, which is often what you do when you just don't think you can get any more resources, right? So we have to figure out how to make sure that that mentality doesn't itself um, translate. Allison. Yeah, just briefly, I think it's important to bring in the, the global factors here because right. sa saving lives is in a, in a situation of scarce resources is going to really generate us versus them divisiveness. And if you've got, uh, you, you're dependent on supplies from a global supply chain, that kind of thing can play out with all sorts of xenophobia as we're already seeing in China with um, uh, racism against Africans. We're likely to see it here. So I think it, it really does need to be placed in a broader international context as we think about how to get the supplies we need to implement any kind of protocol that's going to contain the, the spread. So I'm really all for reviving multilateral institutions to give us as many levers as possible on, on the diplomacy that's going to be required to navigate this internationally. So if you could wave a magic wand, Allison, and make one thing happen in that space that would help us have the resources to increase uh, investment in support of health and reduce the hard choices, reduce the frequency with which we have to confront um, difficult trade-offs and so forth, what, what would that magic wand be? <laughs> the, I wish I had a lot of magic wands, but I think one of the most important thing that's going to be required is leadership to get people to realize that we're all in this together. And here's where I think things like Paul's contract tracing initiative is so important. 
and maybe he could speak a little bit about that because politicians were already seeing it happening. You know, they have uh, uh, self-interested short-term reasons to find enemies, find people to blame. And that has a ter some terrible negative repercussions for how we treat one another within particular communities, but it can also uh, really uh, engender all sorts of international tensions that could exacerbate our efforts to save lives rather than ameliorate them. So I can't stress enough how it, it's important to realize we're all in this together here at home, but also we're all in this together as, as a planet. No, that's terrific. I'd love to call out to Anna and pull in some questions here, um, if you don't mind, Anna. Yes, hello, we've got a question here from Facebook. The US is the single richest country on the planet but our COVID response is a shambles compared to much of the rest of the developed world. To what American specificities do you attribute this startling disjunct? I'll kick that to you, Paul, to start. Yeah, I'd love to give it a shot. You know, um, I, I, uh, I don't know, I, I think in introducing me, you, you did say I was an anthropologist too. Um, and I'm gonna trot out my anthropology hat and say something that anthropologists usually don't say don't invoke the culture, right? This is what we love to do. We're like, what could explain such <laughs> radically different variation in case fatality? Um, this is what drove me crazy during the earthquake. You know, a metal wall falls on someone, they're not gonna be resilient, right? They're made out of flesh and bone and not metal. And you'd swear, uh, you know, looking at some of these epidemics, including Ebola in West Africa or Zika, you know, ripping through Latin America or cholera, you know, in, in Haiti or in Peru 20 years earlier. Um, you, know, you could have a, a, an Olympic level, level of resilience, cultural resilience, right? And you get cholera and you don't have the right IV solution your toast, forget about resilience. And, um, you know, I, I, I do think um, that, that what we need to do is um, to look around at the material circumstances that permit people to, let's say, follow a social distancing regime. Do they have a, do they have a spacious home? Do they have insurance? Do they have a place where they can go and hide and not drive each other crazy? Right? I mean, these are material matters, not cultural ones. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, looking at, um, you know, looking at what we need to muster here, uh, we need some material things. We need staff and stuff and space and systems. You know, if you're in front of someone who has, a, you know, advanced HIV disease, you need a certain kind of staff stuff space system. If you have someone who has acute cholera, you need something else. But um, I'm just a little worried that we go too quickly to these cultural explanations for what are fundamentally economic and material matters. And, and when I say they're social, like racism is a social matter. Yes, it's also cultural, but it's, it, it, you know, we find it in how housing is distributed and who gets into higher education and who has health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna keep on pushing for material uh, That's a hugely important part of the answer. Allison, I want to get your perspective on what of the global differences that you're seeing, what you think the causes are. The causes of, of uh, global differences in what, Danielle? Global differences in the, in the level of response uh, to COVID. So, and I think, I think the question, I think, you know, Paul addressed um, the issue of disparities of impact of the disease. And I think there's also a part of the question that was about why some countries have been much more successful at mounting uh, defenses to the disease. And also, I mean, actually to Paul's point, it, at having those material supports in place um, such that sort of baseline and health is already better provision for people. So if you're looking at that from a global perspective and comparing the US response, Allison, to the response of other countries, what really jumps out at you uh, as making the biggest difference? Yeah, what jumps out at, at me is, is really that we don't have the data yet to assess <laughs> How, how effective the responses have been, because even in places like Singapore, which were, Singapore was lauded for its response, there's been, there's been uh, backward movement. So, so I think we really have to wait to really know what to take away from this. But one thing I could take away from this right now is what you see is 
that there, the United States is kind of an outlier when it comes to public health. We don't have a public health system. And that's true for a variety of reasons to which I think Paul could attest. But from my perspective, it's in part related to our belief in the market uh, to be able to solve all our problems. I wrote, I wrote a book called One Nation Under Contract, which is on the privatization of American foreign policy and government turning over whatever it could to the private sector to execute. And that's been supported by Democrats and Republicans alike. It's not a uh, partisan issue, but it has this weird effect of, in a sense, decimating the public sphere, any sense of public health, public education, public mm -hmm. welfare. So free markets can't resolve a public health crisis in a democratic or a just way. And that's what we're up against in the United States. Govind, what are your thoughts on this? So I think um, I, I share Allison's view that it's in some ways it's, it's too early to predict um, we're going to turn out to be the great success stories. Um, one thing that sort of stands out to me and what I'm seeing so far at least is it feels like um, in the U.S. you have differences in um, the quality of leadership in different states and then also at least it seems to me a difference in the quality of leadership at the federal level, um, maybe between the U.S. and some other countries. And um, even if you look at countries that have similar material circumstances, um, you know, I see some people saying, oh, the problem is the U.S.'s um, lack of, um, the, the U.S. healthcare system is the main problem. And I agree there's, there's much that could be done to make the U.S.'s healthcare system better. But there are a variety of countries with different healthcare systems that have been more effective. They haven't all looked one way. Um, but I think they've all looked better in terms of um, leadership at the national level. I think we've had good leadership at some state levels, um, but not so much at the um, national or federal level. You know, just to, but to put a, to, I, was, I was being a little bit highfalutin there, Danielle, with my example, but just say you want to go to the standard, okay, Germany is doing better than, you know, Italy or something like right. that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the New York Times last week, there are uh, German virology professors saying, well, you know, one thing Germany's got is trust. Right. There's a, cult a cultural answer, but Germany also has the highest number of ICU beds per capita in Europe. And There's probably a relationship between those things, maybe. right? Maybe. Not just that and the trust works now, but it helps supply. Um, sort of social compact, social solidarity commitments inside exactly. society. And they were doing 350,000 COVID tests a week, two weeks ago. So that's incredible. It's not that's cultural, incredible. you know, ancient right. Chinese secrets want right. to have, you know, lots of yeah. testing. It's just not true. It's, it's, it's material as well. Well, let's, let's turn back to that material conversation um, for a minute. Um, Anna, thank you for that. I really appreciate that, that question. Um, and so let's let's talk about that. Um, it it does seem as if um, in this country to date, we have had one tool at our disposal for truly getting the disease under control, and that's national collective quarantine. And it's just also plainly the case that killing the disease by shutting down social life also kills the economy because the economy also depends on social life. So paradoxes sort of the economy and the virus need the same kind of oxygen. Um, and so you take it away from the virus, you're also taking it away from the economy. So in that regard, it looks as if we really do need um, an alternative solution to controlling the virus. And that really does look like it's got to be massively scaling up testing, uh, contact tracing, supported isolation. So can you talk about your work in Massachusetts here, uh, Paul? It was a thousand yeah. contact tracers that you've stood up and, and oh, yeah. is it, you know, can we, can we do this massively for the whole country? I mean, come on, you know, convince me. Why not? Um, anyway, me. I'll convince you. Well, first of all, um, you know, it makes a better story if you tell it like, oh, reverse innovation, right? We learned all these clever little things in Haiti, Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, about how to provide good medical care for chronic disease in a setting where you're not dragging people into hospitals. But, and they get better care and they do better than they would in an American city. Anyway, so that was, uh, that's con community health workers. But community health workers do lots of different things. 
I mean, for example, in, in, uh, in Haiti, Partners in Health has 6,000 employees and Rwanda 5,000. And they're mostly community health workers. They have, they're from the neighborhoods where they're living and working now. Some are doctors, some are nurses, some are lab techs, some are drivers, some are cleaners, some are cooks, but a lot of them are community health workers. And so one of the ways that you, you know, facing these epidemics, I gotta say, I mean, just there's, you, you wanna give a big sigh because it's a lot of work, right? A million cases of cholera coming your way, that's like to, to flee from. But in order to see epidemics go up that hill and down that hill, you know, you really do need to be testing and tracing and treating. And that requires, as you said, really a lot of support. So um, the question in Massachusetts three weeks ago um, was, is it too late? I mean, and some people were saying that. But, you know, it seems to me that we're saying it's too late on behalf of other people, right? As usual with socialization for scarcity. Oh, well, we can't treat her because she's X, you know, she lives in Malawi, whatever, and she has AIDS. So the, the stories, the reasons not to act are numerous. And again, I, I, I trust Govin and Allison on these policy points. I just want to say, the feeling of it, people say, oh, it, we, it's too late. The, the, the governor of Massachusetts was saying that he was tired of hearing that. I'm tired of hearing people saying it's too late. So that was containment nihilism, nihilism not treatment nihilism, which we reserve for people who are black and brown. But here we have even containment nihilism, where people are saying it's too late. So well, long really, answer, okay. but I think that's how you get down the mountain, too. Okay, Govind, let me come in here for a sec. Sure, yeah, I, so I think I, I don't have any disagreement with the idea that um, test and trace is the way that we need to go. I think that there are complex ethical challenges in, um, not even so much ethical, political philosophy challenges, in thinking about how to incentivize and um, the, the, there are two goals that we might be aiming at. One is to get um, more tests developed, get more people tracing, and the other is to distribute those equitably once we get them. And um, so we see, from, it's familiar, right, in the context of, say, antivirals or vaccines, the property mechanisms that are sometimes used to incentivize creating them then create problems for equitable distribution. There's a really nice op-ed by um, uh, uh, IP scholars at um, Stanford and Chicago, uh, Lisa Wellett and Dan Hemmel, where they talk about um, having a big prize um, for vaccine development. You could do something similar um, something like what's been called the Netflix model for paying for um, hep C drugs. You could see if you could do that for an antiviral if it, if it worked. Um, and so it's been frustrating to see um, so much money being put into a stimulus, but so little of that money going toward um, incentivizing the production of um, needed healthcare um, uh, inter interventions that could lead to having not only saving lives, but much bigger economic impact down the road. Allison, what are you, what's, what's your view on this question of whether we can actually um, scale up containment, whether we can break out of containment nihilism um, and get back into the business of it and do it seriously? Yeah, we, well, we certainly can. I mean, this is really just a warning what we've experienced so far. This is, this, we're going to be in this for the long run and it's going to take a sustained effort. I'm with, with Goldman on the way the stimulus package is, uh, what we're spending the stimulus money on, it strikes me that there's a possibility to put money into something like a National Service Corps that could connect up with, with uh, Paul's contract tracing initiative. But here again, I would, I would point out that getting the tests and supplies we need for any sort of plan you'd want to put in place is going to require both public and private diplomacy. Uh, it's going to take a whole of government effort and it's going to take a lot of um, uh, public-private partnerships. But the one thing I think we are going to need to see is some gov federal government leadership on the distribution issue. Uh, because if you're going to have an equitable solution or a, even a solution that's going to promote public health, you need that kind of leadership. So as we're trying to figure out the solutions here and what it would take to actually have a whole of government approach or to get the um, investment in the materials that we need to fight this disease, I, I noticed, Paul, that you referred to lessons from dealing with chronic diseases. Are you suggesting that we should think of COVID-19 as a chronic problem that we're facing? Can you clarify that? 
You've got to unmute. You're muted. You're muted, Paul. Before we leave the the topic that you just brought up, um, you know, we're 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 stuck with this for a long time. So the the whole notion of acuity and chronicity is probably the better the better one. But I, and there are a couple of reasons I brought up uh, chronicity. One is just the clinical features. Um, if you look at the patients, they're sick for over a month. I mean, this is not you know uh, an acute short-term case of influenza. So I'm just noted, noting, I'm noticing encephalitis, carditis. I mean, we were seeing a very sincere multi-organ system illness that goes on in a lot of people, uh, my age in any case, for a month and more. And, uh, and there may be long-term disabilities, we don't know. I mean, there may be renal damage heart damage and brain damage. Those are the ones I'm worried about. And uh, so it's gonna be chronic clinically. Um, and then of course, the big 53, whatever million dollar question, uh, is it going to become less virulent or less transmissible? You know, those have struck me as a good Catholic kid is the kind of thing you pray for, but not the kind of thing you plan on. Uh, I mean, they're just, you know, why, why should we be so lucky? Mm -hmm. You know, the big one in 1918 hit uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone in August. So, so much for it being nice and toasty and the 4% of Freetown was dead within a month, you know? So I think, I think the idea of chronic, even from the basic features of the disease and our society, and then finally, like I said, the worst thing for me as an American has been the surprise it's not a great level or look at what it's doing you know in terms of um you know disproportionate impact on certain communities i think that's a chronic problem it's related to chronic diseases it's related to our chronic pre-existing conditions as a nation which range from jim crow to lack of you know 27 million people don't have health insurance so i think chronic is the watchword and we're going to be getting used to this for the rest of our lives Okay, thank you. That's very sobering. Govind? Thoughts well, um, can you say more about what the, um, just bring me, be, me back to the um, question? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this is really about the question of can we scale up the material resources that we need? And the reason I paused and asked Paul there about chronicity and whether this is chronic is because I think people's approach to thinking about this is going to be really different depending on whether they think this is a, an acute you know, one and done sort of situation or whether they think it really is about a transformation that we need, a transformation of our health resources and so forth. So, um, you know, I were, Paul has got sort of contact tracing um, operation going in Massachusetts and a skeptic will come back to him and say, hey, that's a drop of the bucket. I mean, even for an acute situation, that's a drop of the bucket. And now he's just told me it's a chronic situation, <laughs> which makes me say it's even more of a drop in the bucket. So. I was kind of coming back to you to get your take on right, yeah. what's so, the realistic possibility of, of doing containment, doing it massively, really taking it seriously. Um, so I think it's, I, I do think it's realistic. I do think it's something we can do. I think one um, question that this raises is um, uh, sort of the relative spending on public health versus um, sort of health care. Um, even as we are saying that we're trying to save more lives through healthcare, you're seeing, I mentioned at the start, this um, willingness to uh, allow more uh, PM 2.5 pollution, which we know is- Okay, sorry, uh, I got to define that for everybody. Sorry. Uh, that's a small particulate pollution. It's a small, um, I, I believe just um, uh, basically smaller particles that can get into lungs. And um, once that happens, you see correlations between higher pollution and um, worse COVID outcomes. And so, um, I, one thing, you know, thinking back to win-win solutions is, um, I don't know how many of these would be strictly described as containment, but are there things that we can do that will not only be useful for this COVID-19 pandemic right now, but sort of down the road, all-purpose resources, all-purpose changes that we might make? And I think, I think it's, I can see the case for, say, uh, spending money to get more ventilators. But in some ways, some of these other things, um, reducing pollution, um, some of the steps in terms of having um, properly staffed public health workforces, 
um, are something that seems to be more nimble and can move across a lot of different um, pandemic conditions that we might run into. At the same time, I think there's this attraction to seeing it as sort of just a technical solution. And I think it might be for some reason harder to see in talking about triage, for instance, I think I found it easier for people to imagine scarcity as ventilators. A big problem of scarcity is going to be scarcity potentially of healthcare personnel. And I think people often fixate on the technical as opposed to some of these, I think what could potentially be more valuable, but less easy to see as valuable, um, having, you know, a ton of, as Paul is saying, contact tracers, a ton of people who are um, public health trained nurses, things, things like that. Super fascinating. Thank you. I mean, I, one of the things I've been thinking about in all of this is that if you compare this moment to 2008, 2008 was a kind of wake up call for people with regard to the financial system, right, and the kind of in, the integration of the global financial system and the fact that actually the system as a whole was vulnerable to shocks of particular kinds and sort of complexities of arbitrage and um, so forth. Um, and so post that crisis, there's a lot of work put into the question of how do you ensure that that global financial system um, is resilient and not vulnerable to the blind spots that had existed. And I feel like with this, we've discovered that the economy is vulnerable um, to pandemic, right? The entire economy and the sort of relevant, you know, a, a pandemic resilient economy would be one that had health resources um, successfully and equitably distributed across the entire globe so that the whole globe could take shocks of this kind in a resilient way, not in a sort of absolute sort of show stopping kind of way. Um, I wanted to ask Alison about that too, but I see Anna's come back in with questions. So we'll go to questions and um, I'll, I'll try to get back to you, Alison, as we, as we come to the, um, to the final, final piece here. Great, thank you. Got a question. Can someone please elaborate on some of the decision-making frameworks that can help frame the discussion of economy versus COVID? Uh, Dr. Persad touched on that briefly. Sure, okay. Uh, Govin, would you like to, to start with that? Sure, I mean, I don't, I think that's an area where more important work needs to be done. Um, the traditional tools in economics for thinking about this, people might try to do a sort of um, cost benefit analysis, but there are problems in um, building equity factors into cost benefit analysis. Those, those problems are really well known. Um, I think um, that's a really important task to be working on and thinking about is um, what sort of a framework allows us to, I talked about life-life trade-offs for a different way of thinking about it, but um, uh, how to put into a kind of um, commensurable way, and I do think that um, uh, that is the only way to do it, um, some of the different um, impacts that might result from some measures that we might adopt. So for instance, um, you know, there are discussions around um, right now, um, what would the ethical and economic effects be of um, conditioning being able to do some activities, employment activities, say, on um, if someone turns out to be immune? And I think there's a very thoughtful New York Times piece about this recently. I think that raises some of those um, questions about what a framework would be for thinking about those questions. I think that piece is really valuable because it doesn't say, oh, no, don't do this. In the end, it says, um, but how this is done, you have to have a framework for thinking about how to do it equitably. I think cost benefit analysis is too crude a framework, but I think the core idea behind it of trying to com compare different values, um, give weights to them is the way that you'd have to go. And Allison, um, how would you um, help people think about how to put the economic and health questions uh, together? Oh, sorry, you've got to unmute. Yeah. I, I would just remind people that we face a common enemy. And I'm very concerned about some of the rhetoric I'm hearing both uh, from the Chinese and from our own government on this point. We, we, we don't want to wage a, a cold war with China in a global pandemic when we're dependent on them for vital medical supplies. That makes us vulnerable, not strong. So Americans of both political parties may agree that China deserves reprimand for any manner of things. But this competitive strategy is really misplaced in a global pandemic. If we could cooperate with Stalin to defeat fascism, we can surely cooperate with China in a public health emergency. China, I mean, China published the genome of the virus within days. I mean, it, it's, you know, there's something too uh, about this whole yellow peril kind of discourse that's very troubling to me. We're going to know? see more of it and we just have to resist it. 
Um, it's, we have to resist it. And, and I, you know, it, it flies in the face of the cooperation that, you know, I have friends, of course, who, former students and, and, and friends who are vaccine researchers, they, you know, seize the moment and use the, the, the published genome from, from China. I believe they had Australian colleagues working with them. And they design the, they design a vaccine in, in a week and they already have it in, tested in ferrets. So there. Yeah. I'm just saying we could not have done that without the Chinese. We need yeah. to harness everybody's brain power on this one. That's yeah, and we couldn't even run our labs. You know, I'm not talking just about people, yeah. all the stuff that they make for us. Anyway. So uh, Anna, let's, let's take one final question. Um, we'll have to say goodbye, I'm afraid, but let's, let's have one last question. Okay, the question is, who do you see as the rising star to fill global health leadership gap? And how do you think we will reg that will relate to the tension between the WHO and the US? Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. That's a really hard question. You're giving us a real zinger for the, for the wrap up here. Okay. So I think this one, everybody gets uh, one name. We'll just do what, one name answers. Who's a global rising star. I'll start. I'll just say Paul Farmer. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I vote for Paul Farmer that. too. Okay. Wow. <laughs> thank you. I'm voting. I'm, I'm going to now, I, now I'm torn between Govin and Tony Fauci. He's <laughs> only 79, okay. but he's okay. full of energy. That's good. And Govind, who's your vote? Whoever it was in Iceland who came up with the idea of trying to test, test everybody there to get at what their um, rate of infection was. I think that person is a star. Okay, that's good. That's excellent. I guess I would also put Angela Merkel in the balance, who I think is among uh, world leaders, one of the only ones not to rely on the war metaphor. Again, I pleaded guilty in the beginning of this to having used it myself. Um, so I think there are lessons to learn there. Dumbledore um, raised an army. Well, there you go. Okay. Um, this has been a really helpful, stimulating conversation. The questions are incredibly difficult. And so I'm grateful for the chance to chew on them with all of you tonight. Thank you, everybody who joined us. We are really glad to have had you with us for this hour. Um, we hope you also enjoyed it. And next week, we will be back again to talk about cities and policing and intersections of those topics uh, with COVID as well. So um, join us uh, for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Everyone. Bye, Allison. <laughs> Bye, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Allison. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.